I'm currently working in the area of solar cell technology. It's really important. We are going to transition away from fossil fuels as our primary source of energy, and most of that is going to come from solar cells for the very simple reason that we have unlimited sunlight that lands on the Earth at the moment, not doing anything particularly useful. We only need to harness a tiny fraction of a percent of what lands on the Earth to satisfy all future global energy needs. The challenge, if that's going to happen, is to make it cheap enough. And to make it cheap enough, we need to make it more efficient and we need to go beyond what we do with silicon. And that's the space I'm working in. Solar energy is really important globally. It's done a great job. The cost has fallen to everybody's surprise to the point where it's already the cheapest option for new installation of electricity generation where the sun shines. But it can do even better. And if we look at the challenges that we face globally, what we have to do is to find solutions that are zero carbon, that are cheap enough that everybody can adopt them across all economies, where, they, where we win because the economics are so compelling. So with solar, we match fossil fuel costs. How much lower can we go? If we can really pull the costs down, and I am an optimist, I think we will, it will make a huge contribution to decarbonizing global energy. So what's the game? It's all about efficiency. At the moment, silicon does well, but if you make a solar cell that has only got one color in it, and in the case of silicon, it's infrared, uh, you're limited as to how much of the energy from the full solar spectrum, from visible to infrared, you can turn into useful electricity. To do better, uh, you need to dice the solar spectrum up. You need to handle the infrared separately from the visible. Actually, silicon does the infrared pretty well. So let's regard that as a solved problem, though there may be other solutions. It's the visible, or, um, or, or the red particularly, where we need to do better. And to do that, we need new materials. Now, silicon we borrowed from the electronics industry. We need new materials that are now being, if you like, invented, developed, engineered within the solar research community, which is now flourishing. It's globally, it's a very exciting space. And in Cambridge, we are doing wonderful things. Let me start with a family of materials, which are generally called perovskites. These are materials that have the crystal structure called perovskite. Uh, they're actually metal halide materials, uh, which were known about, um, but not regarded as interesting. And it's turned out over the last 10 years that we now know how to process them as thin films, and they make spectacularly good solar cells. It's a huge surprise, a big science surprise, because by all the laws of silicon and what we thought semiconductors had to be, they're much too dirty to function as good, clean materials to make good solar cells, but they work. And what's really important is that not only do they work, we can tune the color and we can tune them to complement silicon. So you can make a solar cell where you have a top cell of a perovskite that takes off the visible and the infrared then goes through to the silicon below and you can optimize performance for the visible with the perovskite and still get the good performance in the infrared from the silicon. Put the two together and you've lifted efficiency quite a lot. That's a big deal. So the challenges are all the way from the fundamental science, and a lot of that is to, about why, why all the impurities don't matter. And there's wonderful work going on in Cambridge, particularly in chemical engineering, exploring a really a, a new domain of semiconductor materials and semiconductor engineering. Um, and, and then there is the challenge of uh, demonstrating that these things are scalable, presenting solutions that, or um, uh, recipes that can be picked up by industry where one can demonstrate what is needed to get things up to scale as fast as has to be done. And again, across Cambridge, there's a huge amount of activity generating those interactions with industry. Quite a few startup companies uh, were making a big contribution. If one looks at what is gonna happen between now and 2050, we will be using quite a lot of known technologies. But we've got time to get some new technologies in place. 
and we need them. And what's exciting is that we know we need them. We know the timescale when they're needed. We know there's a market. That is a special opportunity. And it's so important that Cambridge is seen to play a big role in leading that maybe longer term uh, vision and delivery to get us up to speed for 2050. Another area of very exciting developments is the use of organic molecules as semiconductors, which has been fully commercialized in organic light emitting displays, OLED displays as we have in smartphones. And that's where my work started. We had some foundational developments that underpin today's OLED displays. Switch those devices backwards, you can make very good solar cells. They're now pretty much up at silicon standards. It's a huge surprise. And there's a lot of work going on, uh, fairly fundamental work, understanding what it is that needs to be done to go even further. That's asking some rather basic questions about what semiconductors are. And there's a further twist that in some of these materials, they'll do what I call a sort of buy one, get one free. You can absorb a visible photon and produce an excitation then that, that then very quickly splits to become two separate molecular excitations, both of half the initial energy, so they're both infrared. And if we can couple that energy into a silicon solar cell below, we can double the efficiency of visible light absorbed in a silicon cell below. So it's, a, it, it's another approach to improving efficiency for a standard solar cell. It, it's very strange quantum mechanics that it's, the, the fact that it is possible to do that is, is not so hard to understand. It looks as though it could be really efficient. That's a big surprise. Getting to zero carbon by 2050 is a real challenge. We can get there. We're all going to have to play a big role. The challenge for Cambridge is that it is something we're all engaged with. It's not just for the engineers to deal with. It's for all of us. There are opportunities everywhere and we need to lead. We need to demonstrate where we can find solutions that take us forward. It's got to be a big collective effort.